It's interesting that in the Buddhist tradition, and you can find analogs in other traditions as well, it is said that there are three fundamental pillars of practice. Uh, in Pali, the language of early Buddhism, they're known as sila, samadhi, and panya. Sila could be translated as virtue, morality, restraint. Samadhi, translated as concentration, mindfulness, and steadiness of mind, the purification and training of our innermost being, and wisdom, panya, insight, including liberating insight into the actual nature of experience, which shifts our relationship to it. So we have virtue, concentration, and wisdom. Concentration is so important. Steadiness of mind is so important that it's right up there with morality and non-harming and liberating wisdom and insight. Concentration is that important. It's kind of the catch-all term for the, the cultivation trainings and the purification trainings that really gradually shift us over time. Steadying the mind is really important. It's really fundamental, but it's not easy to do, both because of our own biological evolution in, in which um, those uh, ancient uh, ancestors who were skittery and distractible and always looking around for the next shiny object, they were maybe more likely to pass on genes that passed on genes. Also, we have a culture that trains us in skitteriness and multitasking and channel surfing and you know shifting from one thing to another continuously. Also, <coughs> throw in personal history of trauma or disruptive experiences or growing up in highly chaotic environments that just seem like the normal. Um, that, too, makes it harder to steady the mind. Steadiness of mind means, essentially, pragmatically, that you can plop your attention on what you want to rest it upon Sustaining interest, for example, to another person, even if what they're saying isn't the most exciting thing in the world. Uh, being able to su sustain attention to your own interior with an increasingly laser-like focus that really promotes liberating insight, that's useful. And it's also really useful to have the underlying sense of stability of present moment awareness that underpins um, steadiness of mind. These are really, really good things to develop, notwithstanding the challenges. The question is, how do we do it, right? Easier said than done. Often uh, people get trained in mindfulness or trained in other things. And, you know, it's basically with the instruction of pay attention, you know, stay there. But, well, how, actually? This is where these wonderful factors come in. Uh, you know, including these five traditional factors of what are called the jhanas, which constitute the right concentration, wise concentration element of the eightfold path laid out by the Buddha. So these non-ordinary states of consciousness are actually part of the domain of practice. It's the eightfold path, not the sevenfold path. And even without tipping into these very, you know, profound non-ordinary states of being, which I have some experience with, um, just in everyday life, these five factors of steadiness of mind are very useful. So I'd like to go through them um, and explain, describe them in a little more detail, respond to some questions or comments that have come up related to them, and also talk about some of their plausible neurological underpinnings, which can motivate us to practice with them and also help us be more skillful in our practice with them as we understand something of what's happening, you know, inside the hardware, inside the coconut. So um, before I begin, though, I just want to, pardon me, acknowledge one thing, which is that in that meditation I did with you, it was, it was ambitious. I just went for it. You know, 35 minutes to move through all five jhana factors, what, are you kidding? Uh, people in traditional retreat environments like in Asia could spend weeks exploring those factors. I just thought we'd go for it. I find in my own experience, the first three are the most accessible in everyday life, applying attention, sustaining attention, and different aspects of broadly joy what's called the joy factor, which for me uh, and my teachers involves a range of experience of happiness, contentment, 
and tranquility. So the full range of those emotionally positive experiences, and I frankly would also f toss in heartfelt uh, kinds of positive emotions such as love, you know, those first three, applying attention, sustaining attention, and I'll call it positive emotion, those are pretty accessible, pretty accessible. The other two, bliss, rapture, on demand, you know, <laughs> That's not so easy, although I think it is fairly easy for some people. I kind of envy them. They can just you know, go into rapture like that. Um, uh, important to keep your feet on the ground, of course, meanwhile. But anyway, uh, but with practice, you can kind of go there increasingly. And as you develop these five factors as traits, aha, develop trait capacities to you know, drop into bliss, or singleness of mind, it becomes more accessible to you, even in a shorter meditation like the one we did. And also, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm biased, maybe rooted in my own human potential background in the 70s, you know, the Wild West of personal growth. Um, I'm just kind of biased to trying stuff, as long as you're careful about it. You know, you don't want to go off the deep end. I do want to call out that the one caution here is if a person is prone to uh, manic episodes in a real way, bipolar disorder, really. Uh, be careful with the bliss factor and be careful with intensities of positive emotion, let's say on the zero to 10 scale, you know, seven on up, be kind of careful about that territory because there is some research that suggests that those sorts of intense positive emotions can tip those who are vulnerable to a manic episode into a manic episode. But other than that, really quite specific and you know fairly uncommon, but still important um, caution. Why not go for it? You know, why not explore these? Why not see what they're like and see if you can, you know, find your own way into them over time. And for me, also, I guess uh, I'm biased toward respecting people, respecting students. I think teachers sometimes can sort of, you know, underestimate the people they're teaching. Uh, and not really just have a kind of go for it, <laughs> you know, spirit with them uh, that is overly cautious and so cautious it can almost be condescending. And I don't really want to do that. I think you can do it. Uh, so that's why I said let's go for it here. And then you see whatever happens. Okay, so I'm seeing that it's okay so far. Uh, and if you have, you know, a psychotic episode, uh, let me know, <laughs> but I don't think you will. Okay, so I wanna talk about them. What's going on in your brain and what are each one of these factors? And like so much in our mind, we differentiate to integrate, right? We start by carving out what is it that we're talking about so we sort of know what it is and what it feels like. That's the most important thing, not the conceptual language labels, but what it feels like. Um, and then knowing what it feels like over time, we can integrate it all together. And what started out as a deliberate and maybe effortful and not always successful attempt to you know, engage these factors and get them going in your consciousness, over time, that deliberate effort becomes increasingly automatic. And you don't have to make a deliberate effort. It just is there. As you've heard me quote the teaching from Melarepa, um, perhaps you've heard me say this in the past as he described his life of practice. He said, in the beginning, nothing came. In the middle, nothing stayed. In the end, nothing left. So in the beginning, we try to encourage things to happen. They may not. Then they're more and more stable, but they're not yet a habit for us. They're not yet a trait for us. And then increasingly, they become hardwired into our body, especially into our own nervous system and brain. And then they're with us in the background and sometimes in the foreground, wherever we go. Okay, so to them specifically. Yes, I said psychotic episode, no psychotic episodes here. You know, if you go out into the deep end of the pool, make sure you can swim back on your own. All right, so applying attention. This is where we have an object of attention that we are attempting to become absorbed in. Concentration trainings are absorption trainings. We are becoming absorbed in something, like the sensations of breathing, or more generally, a sense of deep calm in the body, let's say, deep tranquility in the body. Or maybe we are seeking to become absorbed in a different object of meditation, 
such as feelings of kindness and love, or the sense of gratitude, or even bliss. We are becoming absorbed in that object of attention, and in the second meaning of absorption, we are absorbing it into ourselves. Whoa. We are receiving what we are resting our attention upon into ourselves so that we become increasingly naturally there. Or to make this point, but in a slightly different way, we can understand concentration in two ways. We can understand it as we are concentrating upon some object of attention, which also has the sense of concentrating it like a wonderful sauce when you cook. So that the sense, let's say, of happiness or contentment or tranquility becomes increasingly concentrated, increasingly intensified. You know, it becomes not really, but kind of almost overwhelming. It's so intense. You're so intensely tranquil or contented or happy or whew, present in a unified kind of way. So you have the sense of concentration in two meanings there. Now, there can be a certain effortfulness in concentration practices, in absorption practices. In the beginning, it's okay for there to be a certain effortfulness. But it's important to be careful not to tip into the pitfall of too much effortfulness, too much intensity that can start to feel exhausting or frustrating or it sets you up you know, for evaluating yourself as somehow falling short of the meditator next to you or what happened last time or on that retreat or kind of what, what you want. You know, so you want to find that middle place, right? There's a Zen saying, I believe that we should be with our minds like the skillful rider of a horse, neither too tight nor too loose a rein. The Buddha had a similar metaphor related to tuning a lute, tuning a guitar, a traditional musical instrument 2,500 years ago, that one should not over-tighten the string nor let it be too slack. We should be that way with our own minds, especially when we're doing any kind of training and concentration or absorption. And in particular, um, <clears throat> there can be a feeling of not so much trying to shove ourselves into a state of being, like happiness, contentment, or tranquility, or shove ourselves into a stability of attentiveness, mindful attentiveness to our object of attention, but rather a feeling of um, opening into it from the inside out and from the bottom up with all that is not that which we seek to be absorbed in falling away so that all that remains is the object of absorption, that which we are dwelling in. You may know the traditional term um, the, um, uh, of the Brahma Viharas, the dwelling places, uh, compassion, loving kindness, happiness for others, and equanimity. The word Vihara means dwelling, and I like that. It's very down to earth. Where do you dwell? And what dwells inside you? So in concentration practices and absorption practices, we're exploring uh, dwelling places so that we can become increasingly absorbed in them and concentrated as them so we increasingly dwell there while also they, those qualities of consciousness, steadiness of mind, happiness, contentment, bliss, unification of consciousness, love, dwell increasingly in us. That's the frame here. In this frame, we have these five factors, traditionally. There are others, but these are a good summary, and they contain a lot in them. So applying attention. This involves neurologically a part of the brain that's been quite well studied in relationship to meditation 
the cingulate cortex, especially its frontal portions, thus anterior. Anterior means frontal in contrast to posterior, which is rearward. All right. The cingulate cortex is roughly the shape and length and size of a finger. There are two of them, one on either side, really toward the middle. Um, it's an area of the brain that's been the object of a lot of recent neurological evolution. And um, I believe in the interior, in the cingulate cortex, as well as uh, nearby parts of the brain in the insula, are found some recently evolved neurons. Uh, I think they're called the uh, von Economo neurons. Also, the uh, it'll come to me in a moment. There's another term for them. They're recent uh, evolutionary advances. They seem to be involved with internal awareness and awareness for others. Um, spindle, spindle neurons are also called. Okay, so um, point is, when we're deliberately applying attention to anything, you know, checking a recipe carefully while we cook, uh, or you know, applying attention to our breath, we tend to activate the anterior portions of the cingulate cortex. A key point here is that the cingulate cortex is also involved with it's called error monitoring or goal checking. In other words, it's the part of the brain, kind of like a little inner alarm bell or guardian, who lets you know, whoa, straying off target, come on back. You know, when you kind of um, are, you know, paying attention to your breath and then your mind starts to wander and then you go, oh, come on back, the cingulate cortex is involved with that. Okay. Another interesting finding, though, is that people who are experienced meditators actually have less metabolic activity in their cingulate cortices when they're meditating because they're more efficient. They're more used to it. So we begin with deliberate effort which then over time becomes gradually a habit, becomes gradually automatic for us, all right? And if you like, what you could play around with, as I did with you, is set a goal for yourself that's a stretch goal, but within reach, like a minute straight or 10 breaths in a row, that's about a minute, maybe a little less sometimes, uh, or even a little more, um, or uh, two minutes or five minutes even, or 10 tens, 10, you know, ten, a group of 10 breaths, 10 tens, that's 100 breaths in a row. Set a goal for yourself and then establish a kind of inner monitor, probably somewhat situated in your cingulate cortex, that's tracking when your mind starts to wander away. And in this training of the mind, which is not necessarily a way of life, it's a meditative procedural technique, um, you kind of catch yourself before you start to lose it before you get carried away by that bubbling, you know, mind bubble <laughs> and that's coalescing over a time course of half a second or a couple, three seconds before it sweeps you away, all right? So that's applying attention. And I like the sound of the poly terms for these. This first one is called vitaka, applying attention. The second factor is um, sustaining attention. Vichara, and thus the metaphor of the ice skater, which I heard from Sally Clough Armstrong, who I believe came up with it. So full credit to Sally, a longstanding and wonderful teacher, Sally Clough Armstrong, whose husband, Guy Armstrong, is also a wonderful teacher. Um, it's, a, it's the idea that you stay with it, right? Now, you can also use this approach, sustaining attention um, with uh, other objects of meditation that are that are kind of more stable, such as feelings of loving kindness, although they too have a dynamism or feelings of gratitude. Um, it doesn't have this sense of changing like the sensations of breathing does necessarily, but you're still sustaining attention to it. And I like this instruction I heard from the teacher Eugene Cash on retreat one time. He said, and it was a retreat that was oriented around concentration training. So we were, that's what we were there for. Uh, and Eugene is really a master of this territory. Um, he said, you know, essentially you can be devoted to the breath or the other, another object of attention if you like. You can be devoted to it, renouncing all else. So when we're sustaining attention, we're giving over to it. It's like really, really listening to another person. We give over to them. We kind of let them have us. 
you know, we resource ourselves enough to continue to feel autonomous, you know, uh, while they have our attention. We, we give them our attention. We volitionally have control over where we put our attention. We give it to them. And uh, we're, in a sense, devoted. It, there can be almost a devotional quality to it. We're devoted to whatever we're giving our attention to. You think of a parent very carefully watching the first steps of a child or very carefully monitoring a child who's doing something okay so far, but don't want to get too risky here. You know, a child is walking on a sidewalk near a busy street. You're staying with it there. We're, we're devoted to it. There's that feeling of staying, um, you know, staying with it. Okay, so applying and sustaining. Sustaining attention in the beginning is also managed a lot by the anterior cingulate cortex. Interestingly, as people drop into deeper states of concentration, including moving through the four jhanas, these well-known in the Buddhist time, non-ordinary states of consciousness, uh, by the second jhana, applied and sustained attention falls away. Because at that point, boom, you're in it. But until then, even in fairly subtle, profound states of consciousness, there's still a deliberateness in the, in the sustaining, the maintaining, the applying and sustaining, the maintaining of contact with the object of attention. Okay? Then, really interesting, and I'm going to lump these two together, um, <coughs> the, third and, the, uh, the uh, third and fourth jhana factors in my way of listing them here, um, happiness, and I'll call it bliss. Uh, there are different English translations for these words. I like bliss for the fourth factor because it really kind of captures it. It's also defined uh, sometimes or translated as rapture. I don't know exactly what that word means, but there's definitely a sense of being really in the, in the object of attention. You're like really with it. And here's a key point that came to me from my teacher, Christina Feldman, which is, as long as you're not jumping around too much, if it's skillful, you can change your object of attention in a meditation. So for example, you could start out with the breath. You could commit to it in a, let's say, kind of muscular way for 10 or 15 minutes. You know, which I think of a little bit myself as like charging up the battery, <laughs> you know, building the charge. And then, if you want, shift over to, it's called sukha in Pali, who, which is, because Pali is a, very close to Sanskrit. It's an ancient Indo-European language. That's a root language. Sukha is the root of the word for sucrose, for sugar. It, there's a sweetness in it. So you can shift over to this happiness or gratitude, whatever opens your heart and makes you happy. You know, it's okay even to kind of Foster that sense with a little deliberate half smile. Thich Nhat Hanh recommends that. Um, you, uh, you give over to it. And then you can make that your object of meditation. You can shift from the breath to becoming absorbed in the lusciousness of happiness in whatever form connects to you or that you relate to. You know, in the background could be sorrow. Your heart could be heavy about losses. I have uh, a really well-loved relative of mine who's in the last few days, if not hours, of her life. Um, and that's there, you know. And still, in the, in the core of your being or alongside all that, can be an almost ecstatic lusciousness when these jhana factors are really intensified. Now, they could be more subtle. You know, joy is pretty intense. Happiness, less so. Contentment, less intense. But in a funny way, more sustainable. And then tranquility. The mind beautifully quiet. You know, so happily peaceful. It's fairly subtle. And yet, if it's all pervading, if you're fully given over to that object of attention, much as you would be given over to the sensations of breathing, given over to tranquility, given over 
the contentment. That's a really interesting one to marinate in because it undermines so directly the machinery of craving uh, called out by the Buddha as a major engine of suffering. When we're deeply contented, it's really hard to crave because <laughs> you're already so contented. All right? You can make that your object of attention. In the brain, it is so interesting that while scientists know a lot about the neurological underpinnings of addiction and depression and trauma, we actually know fairly little scientifically about the neurological underpinnings of well-being. We mostly know it as an absence of the neurological underpinnings of, I'll call them negative, form, states of mind, forms of suffering. Uh, but there are some indications. So with <clears throat> the sense of um, the happiness factor, sukha, as well as the, the bliss factor in Pali called piti, P-I-T-I. Um, there is certainly a sense of dopamine activity in which tracks the feeling of reward and the expectation of reward. And interestingly, upregulated increased dopamine activity in the neural substrates of what's called working memory which is a major basis for steadiness of mind. Because if we're steadily present with something, it remains in working memory. So operationally, how do we maintain a particular object of attention in working memory? Well, there's a gate, effectively, neurologically, in working memory that when it's closed, we stay on target. We stay with whatever we're paying attention to. Uh, this gate is regulated by dopamine, so steady streams of reward keep the gate closed so we stay focused. So it's helpful to have a sense of reward, even if it's about the breath. Oh, the breath. I love the breath. You know, Ajahn Brahm, a wonderful meditation teacher out of Australia who has been a major source historically in the full ordination of uh, women in certain traditional Buddhist orders against a fair amount of pushback and from the hierarchy. So bows to Ajahn Brahm. Um, I think he wrote a book, Mindfulness, Bliss, and Beyond, about deep concentration practice. He talks about the beloved breath, in love with the breath, right? So there, simply with the breath, can be a strong sense of dopamine reward, um, and also certainly with emotionally positive experiences like happiness, contentment, and tranquility, or love, you know, lovingness, just all mushed together even. Um, certainly dopamine activity is present. So a steady stream of dopamine keeps the gate closed. When dopamine drops, the gate opens. And also, interestingly, when dopamine spikes with a new reward opportunity, the gate opens to let that new opportunity in. So sustained experiences of positive reinforcement, of reward, including emotionally through emotionally positive experiences including subtle ones like tranquility pervading your mind sustained dopamine activity helps us remain focused and if we're really blissing out right even in subtle things like tranquility that just pervade the mind oh i like this so much this is so good remembering that if you receive it into yourself there will be less clinging to it less craving and grasping for it. So receiving it into yourself, ah, dopamine levels are so high, you can't get a spike, they're at their ceiling. So you stay steadily concentrated upon and absorbed in whatever you wanna pay attention to. Isn't that great? Happiness is skillful means. And then we have the last factor of, oh, I should add as well, in ways that again are not deeply understood, I'm sure, <clears throat> that when we really drop into bliss, there must be intensity of natural opioid activity in the brain. Um, there is something about bliss that just runs through your body. Maybe there's subtle energies involved, you know, within the ordinary reality, but still not well understood at all by science, running up the spine, kundalini kind of processes. Don't know. Um, Bliss is powerful. It's interesting that the Buddha identified bliss as one of the seven factors of awakening, um, along with effort and investigation, mindfulness, um, tranquility, equanimity, and concentration. Right? Uh, bliss is a, is a factor of awakening. 
Like, oh. Uh, and I find that bliss for most people is not that accessible in a home practice. You can go for it. If you can access it, great. But still, what's much more available is to take uh, emotionally positive experiences of love or gratitude, happiness, contentment, tranquility, etc., and really marinate in them, really explore the concentration of these beneficial qualities of consciousness and really absorbing them into yourself. I'll finish up in a moment with the last jhana factor now of singleness of mind, unification of consciousness, um, ekagata in Pali, ekagata. This factor is a little harder to describe. It's talked about in almost mysterious ways, like what does that mean, unification of consciousness, singleness of mind. My own experience of this is that it too is not so accessible in home practice, but you can start to come into it. My hunch is that since it's described as a gestalt kind of experience where there's a unification as a single effortless whole of presence and beingness, that training in the ways I talk about, including in the uh, fourth major practice in my book, Being Wholeness, that I also talk with you about, when you come into a sense of your body as a whole, and then start to include sounds in that wholeness, and then thoughts and other sensations and, and the totality of your mind, including awareness, whew, that's a way to train in a kagata. It's a way to train in a singleness of mind. And there can be a sense of transition into it so that, let's say, your, your attention is stable, applied, and sustained. Your mind's not wandering very much. You're really rested in a quality of well-being, broadly, sukha, happiness, contentment, tranquility, on that spectrum, maybe with a warm-heartedness, a lovingness in the mix. So there you are. You've been meditating now for 20 minutes, 35 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe with surges of blissfulness. Like, oh, oh. They don't quite ignite and take over, but oh, they're there. And then, kuthunk. It's like a sense of just whew, arriving, boom, like an effortless presence. And you start maybe to experience what can be called access concentration, which again is defined by different people and different teachers and different traditions, different degrees of intensity. I think there are levels of access concentration. And you can kind of enter into the beginnings of that, and it's called access because it starts to give you access into the true jhanas. You're not there yet, right? It's important to draw these distinctions so that when you actually are in a jhana, you really get it. You're no longer in Kansas anymore. It's not normal. It's not the usual, right? So we can make that distinction. Still, we can appreciate access concentration coming into it. Now, I am summarizing a lot of material that is well taught and elaborated by numerous people. Shyla Catherine, uh, written a beautiful book about concentration. Um, Lee Brasington, a major teacher in this territory. Um, Richard Shankman, excellent teacher. Tina Rasmussen and Steven Snyder, wonderful teachers in this territory. Kula Dasa, a uh, great teacher in this territory. And then, of course, traditional teachers like Paul Oxayadow. So I'm pulling a lot of stuff together that you may recognize, but I think, okay, why not? This is, these are factors that we can explore for a long, 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 long time. I was first introduced to this material, I don't know, 15, maybe more years ago, and I've been exploring it ever since with great personal benefit because it gives you a foundation for your insight trainings and the virtue trainings. So this concentration gives you a really good foundation for... Uh, you know, really developing the virtue uh, aspect of practice and the wisdom aspect of practice. And so to finish up here, then I'll open it up briefly and then we'll finish on time for once on my part. Um, you know, we'll, uh, uh, the point about just dropping in, so there you are. And you may have experienced this already, right? Um, there you are, steadily present, awash in positive emotion, 
marinating, uh, feeling your body as a whole, opening into your mind as a whole, and then there's a kind of shift in which it all comes together, and there you are. With a greater sense of effortlessness in your presence. It can feel a little, um, it's less, there's less sense of I in the unification of consciousness. It's, it's the person as a whole, it's the being as a whole, with ego really falling away much more. Singleness of mind. Last, if you like, this is a suggest, traditional suggestion. You can almost invoke these qualities. You can invite them. There's a, sometimes a heartfelt devotional aspect here. May applied attention arise. May vitaka arise. May sustained attention arise. May vichara arise. May happiness arise. May sukha arise. May bliss or rapture arise. May piti arise. May singleness of mind, unification of consciousness arise. May akagata arise. Okay. Lots of toys, lots of tools, fun to play. Okay, so. Lots and lots of questions and comments have come in. You can see the chats. These are wonderful. Uh, I don't have a prayer, uh, speaking of devotion, to get to all of this. I just want to see. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to move through. I'm going to make a few comments that you'll, you'll see that I'm relating to your question or comment. I don't think I'm going to have time to speak to anyone in particular tonight, but I think what I'll do next week is I'll keep going with this. Uh, if you have friends who are interested in this, it would be great to invite them to come along with us next week. You might also check out the material in my book, Neurodharma, that's about concentration practice under the heading of steadiness of mind. So, um, key question from Tim. Uh, can you practice the jhanas simultaneously with mindfulness practice? Key question. So, we are mindful if we are engaging choiceless, effortless awareness. We are also mindful if we are concentrating on something in particular, like an object of attention such as happiness or the unification of consciousness. They're not at odds with each other. This is a very important point. Uh, mind, there's, there's mindfulness in all of these. Now, if you're just trying to help yourself to a, what's called, as a misnomer, a typical Vipassana style practice or mindfulness-based stress reduction kind of practice where you're in open awareness, that's not a concentration practice. Uh, you can become increasingly concentrated in that open awareness, but it's a different, it, it feels different. You're trying to do as little as possible. You're just sitting. It's like shikantaza in Zen, you're just sitting. That's different from the jhana trainings and the jhana factors trainings, but they all start to weave together, honestly, you know, increasingly for yourself. And um, yeah, and I, I think, uh, you find your own way with this. I think it's quite helpful actually to start with more concentration trainings, not necessarily moving into the jhanas, but stabilizing your qualities of presence. Then it's a lot easier to move into open choiceless awareness. And then after you've practiced choiceless awareness a while, it can, you know, kind of feel sort of, it's cool, but it's, it's almost bland. Oops. <laughs> and that's where I think it can help to come back to some of these more concentration practices, including you might find them in the Tibetan tradition, where we're seeking to unify ourselves with some object of attention that's juicier or more lively or more um, purifying of our consciousness. And then maybe we swing back. Or what will sometimes happen, especially if you move into the jhanas, like you look at the description of the fourth jhana, it's really about 
open awareness a lot, but profound equanimity. But it's an equanimity that feels so luscious, saturated. Like when something's concentrated, it becomes saturated with it, right? Like a sponge that's, you know, fully concentrated in the liquid, it's saturated. You know, I'm using these very sensual metaphors because that's how they talk and, and that's how it really is. The Buddha actually used a metaphor like this to describe rapture, to become so saturated with it, like making bread. You want the flour, which is kind of dry and bland, and all right, flour, you know, da da. You want to uh, saturate it with the milk or the oil or the liquid, you know, you know, mm, that's rapture. Okay. One more, and then I'll bounce, all right? And the point is, it's all cool. Uh, you can have intuition, you know, that kind of guides you. If it feels to you like you're, you're working too hard in your concentration trainings, lighten up and go back to simple present moment awareness, you know. On the other hand, if you can drop into present moment awareness and it's cool, but, you know, your practice doesn't feel that luscious, <laughs> check out this other stuff, including in other tradition, other aspects of the Buddhist tradition and even other traditions as well. And you'll find these, you'll find these uh, factors, by the way, and I'll finish on this point. Uh, I have friends who are Christian contemplative practitioners, and you'll find these factors described elsewhere. And I suspect it's because whether you're doing Sufi practice or Jewish practice or secular mindfulness practice, you're practicing with the same brain. We all have basically the same build-out instructions. We received a conception, right, in our DNA of the human brain. And so you find these um, factors described in different terms, but there is this quality, right, including an appreciation of lusciousness and juiciness. There are pitfalls in becoming overly addicted to the bliss. There are also pitfalls in a practice that's overly austere and analytical and dry. Great. This was awesome. You, you all did great. I could feel your support. You know, because it's, a, you know, it's bold. I, I, I was in Buddhist, the Buddhist world for 20 years before anybody ever talked about this stuff. I'm like, what? It's the Eightfold Path. You know what I mean? The Pali Canon, uh, the Buddha's early teachings are just saturated with encouragement for uh, training in st studying stability of presence, steadiness of mind. Um, yeah, this is good stuff. Okay, how about we sit together just for a minute, steadily, and happily, contentedly maybe, to let it sink in. And then I'll ring the bell. Those who want can leave, and those who remain by 25 to the hour will be sorted into the Zoom breakout rooms for further discussion. Okay, present. Thank you very much. I really encourage you to explore this experientially. That's the key. And allow yourself to marinate in lusciousness for the sake of all beings. Right back at you. Thank you very much and take good care. <laughs>